Good morning, good evening, and good day to everyone. Welcome and greetings for uh, everyone participating in today's forum. Um, we'll, we'll let Paula introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much um, for being here. And well, good, good morning for me because it's morning here, but good evening and good day to everyone else uh, joining us from anywhere else in the world. Um, thank you for joining us in this very necessary conversation. My name is Paola. I'll be co-facilitating today with Terry, and I'm here representing the committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador, also known as CISPIS. Um, we just wanted to send our solidarity to the global peoples and liberation struggles today, as we are, as we have, as we were founded by Salvadoran refugees and allies as a grassroots organization um, to support the guerrilla movement in the 80s that was backed that was fighting a military dictatorship backed by the US. Um, our work over the last two years during this critical moment in our societies as we're seeing so many of our communities affected by COVID has been to continue accompanying the social movement of El Salvador as a fight as they fight against an escalating dictatorship by the Bukele regime, which interestingly enough, um, he's Palestinian, but he's pro-Israeli and a lot of like my my Palestinian comrades are happy that um, without knowing that he's a dictator, they have been really happy that he's Palestinian. But the world needs to know that he's um, a dictator and that he's not a good thing for any oppressed peoples in the world. Um, and we have also been mobilizing around uh, cutting financial aid to the region by the United States government, which sends this money with the int intention to strengthen this said regime and regimes across the region. 
Um, a current campaign we have going on is hashtag end harmful aid in Central America, which is around economic development aid for security, security and military to the region in Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, we recently released a letter that 130 organizations signed on to. I can link it in the in the chat below, um, which is around oh challenging this White House plan for Central America, which is centered around security, surveillance, and militarization, and really U.S. control in this region. So we just wanted to remind folks and let folks know that although the United States publicly denounces the Bukele regime now uh, behind closed doors and privately, they're still funding his military app apparatus. Um, which to us identifies their actions as having a very imperialistic agenda. And we just wanted to remind folks of that and just happy to be here. Thank you all for um, being here in this very important conversation. And I'll go ahead and pass it back on to Terry. Thank you, Paula. It's great to be here with you and to co-facilitate today. Uh, CSPES has been doing powerful work uh, against U.S. military and economic support for El Salvador. So it's great to be in solidarity with the people of El Salvador and uh, great to be here with you today. I'm based in San Francisco. I'm currently in New York City, uh, but I'm organizing uh, with the International Migrants Alliance. My name is Terry Vallon. Uh, we're focused on building the grassroots movement of migrants, refugees, and displaced people around the world and in solidarity with the people's struggles all over the world. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. Um, we will slow down a bit for interpretation. I have to remember that as well. Uh, we just wanted to share a few logistics for our forum today. Uh, we want everyone to please select the language of choice for our interpretation today. So there's a slide showing there. Uh, there's a little globe at the bottom of your screen if you're on your computer. Today, today, we have English, Spanish, and Bahasa Indonesian interpretation available. So English speakers should choose the English channel. Just in case others will speak in one of the non-English languages, you'll be able to hear it in English. And the forum today will be live streamed on the Facebook pages of Migrante International and ILPS, I believe, cross-posted there. So it will be available afterwards. Um, and um, in the chat box, maybe we can share the links for the Migrante uh, International Facebook and the ILPS uh, Facebook pages. Uh, so it'll be recorded and available for later viewing on Facebook. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Paula. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Our forum today will discuss um, the role of overseas compatriots in national and democratic struggles in their home country. And we'll discuss what migrants can do to advance solidarity and the fights against, um, and the people's fights fights against imperialism. This is a very timely topic as tomorrow, December 18th is International Migrants Day. And in building the movement of migrants, it is important for us to discuss this topic that will also shape the orientation of our movement. Great, so in, without further ado, we would now like to call the chairperson of the International League of People's Struggle, IOPS, Mr. Len Cooper, to give us his opening message. Um, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Paula. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. The ILPS welcomes you all who are attending and taking part in this important forum on the role of overseas compatriots in national and social liberation movements. In particular, we thank and welcome our distinguished leaders and speakers who are assisting with the examination of this question. Commission 15 of the ILPS, which is the commission dealing with the diaspora, refugees and migrant workers, is one of a network of 19 commissions, each of which deals with the 19 central concerns of the ILPS, around which the ILPS organises and mobilises in the interests of the people of the globe. Commission 15 is to be congratulated for organising this webinar on this important topic and the forum will be conducted on a talk show format where a set of prepared questions are organised for the main speaker and where some people called reactors give a short response to the inputs of the main speaker. Following this, webinar participants can be involved with questions and interventions. 
We are delighted to have as the main speaker, Professor Jose Maria Sisson, longtime chairperson of the ILPS, and now chairman emeritus of the ILPS. Welcome, Professor Sisson. As the reactors, we're also delighted to have involved uh, Mohamed Khatib, the European coordinator for Sumedan Solidarity Network for Palestinian political prisoners. Nilofer Koch, spokesperson for the Commission of Foreign Relations of the Kurdistan National Congress. And Gabrielle Malspin, co-chairperson of New York Borokawa Resistance. And I apologize for any incorrect pronunciation. Uh, this webinar takes place as the crisis of the capitalist system throughout the globe worsens and deepens. The pandemic has exposed the failures and the crisis more so than ever, and no more so than by the existence of hundreds of millions of refugees deriv driven from their homes and countries by economic collapse, by war, by oppression, by climate crisis and destruction of the environment. Only the unity of the refugees with the solidarity of the working people, peasantry and farmers of all lands can change this situation. This forum aims to assist this process and to help build the social and national liberation movements against imperialism, which are developing. We wish you all the best in your deliberations and we wish you well for a successful conference. Long live international solidarity and the fight for national and social liberation. Thank you for the opportunity to be involved. Ben Cooper, Chair of the International Coordinating Committee of ILPS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Len Cooper, uh, the current chairperson of the International League of People's Struggles for those opening remarks. Um, as Len mentioned, uh, today's forum is organized by members and participants in Commission 15 of the ILPS. And I'll just say a little bit about Commission 15. It's a, one of the study commissions of the ILPS that focuses on the rights and welfare of the diaspora, refugees and migrant workers displaced by imperialism and local reactionaries. The worsening crisis of imperialism, as you mentioned, forces people to look for places often far from home in order to survive. Uh, traveling and finding uh, places to work and live is a basic human right. However, due to the worsening crisis of imperialism, millions of people, hundreds of millions around the world are forced to leave their home country and regions because of conflict and war, um, poverty, natural, natural disasters, among other reasons, and must find alternative places to survive. As victims of imperialist war and colonialist plunder, Diaspora refugees and migrant workers are potentially part of the growing people's movement fighting against imperialism and its cohorts and in strengthening, in strengthening international solidarity. It is a task of Commission 15 to bring the diaspora refugees and migrant workers to the ILPS and provide members with the tools such as research studies, conducting fora as we are today, webinars and conferences to understand and grasp the importance of being organized and being part of the national movement in their home country. Likewise, the commission encourages migrants to help strengthen solidarity with the people's movement in the destination country where they are, to, and where they are, and to be part of the global movement fighting against imperialism. As um, ILPS chairperson Len, Len Cooper mentioned, today's online forum will be conducted in a talk show format where a set of questions are prepared and raised during the actual webinar for the main speaker. Aside from the main speaker, there will be a set of reactors who will give a short response to the inputs provided by the main speaker. Afterwards, participants will be given the chance to offer questions and interventions as well. Thank you, Paula. So now it is our honor and privilege to introduce to you our main speaker for tonight, for today. Uh, he is the co-founder Oh, so, sorry, he is the founding chair of the ILPS and also has also led the league up to 2019. He is also known as the founder of the Communist Party of the Philippines, a patriot, revolutionary, and internationalist. He has been imprisoned, tortured, and forced into exile. Imperialists and the reactionary Philippine government 
continue to malign and persecute him for his anti-imperialist and revolutionary stance. Throughout the years, he has also provided very valuable insights in the building of the overseas Filipino movement. He is also currently the chief political consultant of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. Comrades, please welcome to the, the chairperson emeritus of the ILPS, Professor Jose Maria Sison. Professor Sison, welcome. Um, if it's okay with uh, thank you. Thank you for the welcome. And I would like to express uh, my uh, warmest greetings of solidarity to the host and my co-speakers, uh, Nilufer and uh, uh, Mohammed, and uh, to uh, uh, Chairperson um, uh, Len Cooper and all colleagues in the International League of People's Struggle, and uh, to all friends uh, who are participating in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Professor Sison, and again, welcome. Uh, if it's okay with you, we would like to go ahead and ask you the questions we've prepared on the role of overseas compatriots in national and social liberation struggles. My co-facilitator Paula and I will alternate posing each question to you for your responses. Um, that's okay. And then our first question, yeah, we'll go ahead and start. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so the first question that we prepared is, is it correct to say that the main cause of modern day migration of peoples can be basically rooted to the internal social economic and political conditions of their home countries? Can migration of peoples be a barometer of the crisis in countries of origin? Yes, it is correct to say that the main cause of modern day migration of peoples can be traced to the internal social, economic, and political conditions of their home countries. The migration of peoples is a barometer of the crisis in the country of origin. It is often claimed that even outside crisis conditions, the natural rise in population coupled with a locality's limits and carrying capacity will already drive migration. It is true that as more and more new households arise, while the local resources base, resource base does not equally expand, they will usually outmigrate to nearby areas with more livelihood opportunities. This was probably true in the heyday of feudalism. Under semi-feudal and semi-colonial conditions, however, these migratory tendencies become class stratified, intensified, systematic, and oppressive, and turn not just into indicators, but also as complicating factors of the system's chronic crisis. The severe conditions of exploitation and oppression in semi-colonial and semi-feudal Philippines are the main cause of the migration of at least 10 million documented and undocumented Filipinos to more than 100 countries in the world. In concrete terms, the high rate of unemployment, low incomes, and mass poverty have compelled Filipinos to seek employment in urban areas and abroad. The trend has been worsened by other push factors, such as the neoliberal policy of cheap labor export, land grabbing, uh, large scale militarization, environmental degradation, and the lucrative business of labor and group, uh, recruitment. So the causes that are not entirely internal to a country, but you have the external force uh, U.S. imperialism imposing uh, the neoliberal policy. The gravity of the socioeconomic crisis of the ruling system is the most conspicuous factor of forced migration. The migration of 10 million Filipinos means that a sizable proportion of the country's working age population cannot be employed in the Philippines. In fact, the Philippine statistic Authority of the Philippine government considers overseas Filipino workers as no longer part of the country's official labor force of 48.8 million. They are not even counted as part of the country's working age population of 75.1 million uh, people. Both figures are uh, June, uh, are, are as of June 2021 estimates. As of June 2021, uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority Labor Force Survey 
shows um, uh, that uh, the COVID lockdowns uh, uh, started to ease up. Uh, another 10.2 million Filipinos stayed in the country or more than one fifth of the official labor force were either unemployed or underemployed. The PSA estimated high employment rate of 93.8% uh, June as of June 2021 is empty propaganda because first it includes what it underestimates as underemployed at 14.2%. Uh, and of course, the huge mass of seasonal farm workers and odd jobbers in both rural and urban areas. And second, it discounts from the labor force such major categories of de facto unemployed as housewives, those who have given up the job seeking or those still listed as overseas workers, but have been stranded or repatriated due to COVID shutdowns and layoffs. The distribution of those employed is supposed to be 18.1% in industry, 24.2% in agriculture, and 57.6% in the service sector as of June 2021. Yeah. Is there any interruption? In each sector, most of those employed have no job tenure and receive subhuman incomes. The service sector is the most notorious category for concealing the underemployed and odd jobbers from the surplus population or reserve army of labor from both rural and urban areas. I think we can proceed to the next question. Thank you, Professor Sison. Our next question is, how do the crises of global monop monopoly capitalism shape modern day migration? And how has, um, how has the current neoliberal framework exacerbated forced migration? For context and comparison with current migration trends, let me share some historical trends in the capitalist era. Countries that have undergone the process of capitalist industrialization through the 18th and 19th centuries, from Europe to America, Russia and Japan, for example, have experienced massive migration from their countrysides to their respective cities and industrial zones. This is because whenever capitalism is allowed to run rampant, that process is one of the easiest ways for generating cheap labor for the burgeoning industries and also for freeing the land to be turned into capitalist farms, mines, industrial facilities, and new towns connected by road and rail. We only have to be reminded of the enclosures first in England, then in other European countries, which essentially resulted in forced migrations, first to rural towns, then to cities. The requirements of imperialism from the late 19th uh, century through the entire 20th and early 21st centuries has further intensified and globalized these migration trends. Remember that the USA relied not only on freed Southern slaves and migrants from the poorer countries of Eastern and Southern Europe for its heavily industrialized East and Midwest, but also on very cheap coolie gangs from China and its Philippine colony to fill up labor scarcity in the fast developing West Coast, Hawaii and Alaska to be followed later by Latin American migrants. The crisis of global monopoly capitalism continues to shape modern day migration. The problem of stagflation arose in the US as a result of the crisis of domestic overproduction in the 1970s, aggravated by the reconstruction of industries in Western Europe and Japan, which had been devastated by World War II. The US economy was also distorted by massive war production, deployment of hundreds of overseas military bases and wars of aggression. Neoliberalism was a French trend of thought, 
until it was adopted by U.S. imperialism as the fake solution to the problem of stagflation. At the core of this problem was the decreasing income of the working class and therefore decreasing demand for consumer goods. The U.S. made the other traditional imperialist countries follow its lead through the Washington Consensus, the IMF, World Bank, and uh, the GATT a series of talks leading to the WTO in adopting the neoliberal policy regime. This policy regime is founded on the dogma of unbridled greed, that the monopoly bourgeoisie is the creator of wealth and jobs, and that it must have the utmost freedom to accumulate and centralize capital in its hands. The objective supposedly is to undermine is, uh, and the objective is uh, uh, firmly eh, to undermine and weaken uh, the working class and the trade union movement by attacking job security and trade union rights, press down wages, decrease taxes of corporations and individual investors, cut back on labor benefits and social services, liberalize trade and investments, privatize public assets and abuse public debt for the private benefit of the monopoly banks and firms. Since its adoption in 1979 by the US and other imperialist countries, neoliberalism has accelerated the extraction of surplus value from the working class by the monopoly bourgeoisie and has degraded socioeconomic conditions in the traditional imperialist countries. Marxist and most bourgeois social sociologists alike are agreed that the neoliberal assault was one of the main causes of the marked decline in trade union gains, workers' rights, and the strength of the workers' movement as a whole in the industrial capitalist countries. In the underdeveloped countries like the Philippines, neoliberalism teamed up with neocolonialism to further disemploy and impoverish the people and increase rapidly the number of the unemployed, vulnerable to recruitment for cheap labor export alongside the export of cheap raw materials. In certain countries targeted by the US led war and terror, such as uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and the parts of Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, the deadly combination of neoliberalism, neocolonialism, and neoconservatism has created humanitarian disasters of horrific proportions, the most visible symptoms of which, such as militarized refugee camps, mass tracks by land and sea, and breakdown of social services are just the tip of the iceberg. Neoliberalism also teamed up with modern revisionism in the former socialist countries to accelerate the restoration of capitalism and the domestic exploitation and export of cheap labor from these countries. Some former socialist countries of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, such as Poland, the Balkans, uh, including former Yugoslavia and the Ukraine have turned into major pools of migrant labor for the more industrialized countries of the European Union. Thank you, Professor Sison. Uh, we have a third question now. Uh, is modern day migration therefore forced migration in essence? What do you say to agencies who claim that migration is individual choice, positive, and can be a tool for national development, or that migration is a natural phenomenon born of globalization? Modern day migration is forced migration in essence. What can be more forcible than be compelled to accept cheap and risky employment abroad and separation from one's family under the pain of unemployment, hunger, and death? When they get employment abroad, the migrant workers are liable to get the dirtiest and lowest paid jobs and become easy prey to the violation of fundamental human rights and basic democratic rights. State and private agencies are lying when they claim that migration is an individual choice, 
positive and can be a tool for national development or that migration is a natural phenomenon born of globalization or professional advancement. There is the superficial appearance of free individual choice only because the migrant workers apply individually for recruitment and travel, even if the, the overseas migrant worker usually has the advantage of being able to converse in English over the far less educated seasonal farm workers and general run of odd jobbers in the Philippines. The false illusion of free choice is also strengthened in a handful of cases where the migrants are the lucky few recipients of graduate school scholarships, scientists and engineers, health professionals, top corporate personnel or long-term diplomatic posts, or of wealthy Filipinos expanding their overseas interests, which are certainly a small part and not representative of the international migration flows. In the underdeveloped and less developed countries, which are the largest source of cheap migrant labor, there is the official rationale that migration is a tool for national development. But the foreign exchange earnings of the migrant workers have been used entirely or mainly for import dependent consumption, for guaranteeing the neoliberal credit for building shopping malls and skyscrapers and for foreign debt repayment by the states, seen as a systematic social phenomenon and not merely as individual decisions, migration reveals many levels of being forcible, even in the absence of open state coercion. Social conditions may be so severe and ruling class interests so contrary, especially in the face of environmental disasters and armed conflicts that entire communities are obliged to relocate elsewhere. In the extreme forced migrations are the direct result of state law and armed coercion used to achieve concrete ruling class aims. Such as when the US government herded Native American tribes into reservations or when Nazi Germany herded entire Jewish populations into concentration camps. Let us recall the long record of modern imperialist states in committing such crimes amounting to genocide or ethnocide. Even the UN World Food Program acknowledges that there is a wide continuum of causes and types of migration in which the category at one pole conveniently called economic migration migration by choice gradually blends into forced migration, migration out of necessity at the other pole. A key finding in a 2019 UN World Food Program report was that hunger and armed conflict were the key drivers of migration. The report stated, countries with the highest level of food insecurity coupled with armed conflict have been the, have the highest outward migration of refugees. Additionally, when coupled with poverty, food insecurity increases the likelihood and intensity of armed conflicts. Migration is indeed a conspicuous phenomenon related to the imperialist policy of neoliberal globalization and the warlike character of imperialist states. But it is not something that is unavoidably natural. Patriotic and democratic peoples and governments in underdeveloped countries can decide to become independent of imperialist and reactionary dictates, pursue their own economic development through national industrialization and genuine land reform. And on that basis, ensure democratic governance, justice, and peace. While we view migration, especially in the massive scales we see today as objectively driven by the mechanisms of imperialism, we should realize that it also triggers strong pushbacks and complex cross currents within host countries. These include racial ethnic conflicts, uh, racial or ethnic conflicts, which the ruling classes manipulate for their own ends anti-immigrant laws and sentiments, and even harsher border controls, and police restrictions 
especially in times of economic and political crisis. The anti-immigrant pushbacks in the US and European Union, which were already simmering by the late 1990s, became prominent starting in 2015 to 2016 and further tightened during the COVID lockdowns of 2020 to 2021. These counter trends bear close watching for their possible long-term effects, both among migrant peoples in the host countries and on the social economies of their homelands. Thank you, Professor Sison, for that response. Our fourth question for you today is how best to solve the problem of forced migration? How much of it is how much of it can be through reforms or an international or as international agencies will say, management of migration, isn't social revolution the real answer to this? The best way for the Filipino people and other peoples in underdeveloped countries to solve the problem of forced migration is to assert and realize full national independence from the dictates of imperialism and its puppets and to carry out a policy of economic development through genuine land reform and national industrialization that would immediately generate jobs for the huge number of unemployed and underemployed. Under the ages of a truly democratic state, economic development would sustainably provide decent wages, health and housing benefits, and other social services that the people in underdeveloped countries have long urgently needed, but for many generations only saw such comforts in more developed countries. Endless calls for reforms or reformism and availment of super profits seeking foreign investments or so-called assistance by pro-imperialist agencies and their NGO agents will not enable the people of underdeveloped countries to achieve a situation where they can achieve economic development. The people and their revolutionary forces in the said countries have to achieve national and social liberation through the people's democratic revolution. Great. Uh, we now move to the fifth question. In the context of rapid migration of peoples, has it changed the principle of waging revolution in national boundaries under the area of imperialism? under the era of imperialism. The rapid migration of peoples has not changed the principle of waging revolution within national boundaries in the era of imperialism. On one hand, such migrations do create potentially more favorable conditions for a common working class consciousness cutting across multiple nationalities and ethnicities and developing a strong inter-imperialist and developing a strong internationalist orientation. But even if we are proletarian revolutionaries, we do not advocate world wars uh, or cross-border wars to win the world proletarian revolution. We remain committed to the principle that social revolutions are carried out within national boundaries, unless the imperialist powers carry out the cross-border war and they need to be rolled back, as in the case of the Soviet counteroffensive against the German and other fascists in World War II, or in the more recent cases of the Kurdistan and Palestine peoples who are still fighting for a national homeland. And so the revolutionary armed struggle have had to extend across certain national borders to adjacent territories or refugee camps in neighboring countries. The migrants are usually a minority in relation to the host people. They can and must support the revolutionary struggles of the host people, but must not take away from them, the host people, uh, the revolutionary initiative and main effort to carry out the, socialism, the social revolution. The migrants have the right and duty to pay attention to their own needs and democratic rights and to support the revolutionary struggle in their motherland, but they also have the right and duty to support the host people in the revolutionary struggle in the spirit of anti-imperialist solidarity and proletarian internationalism. 
we do realize that as the second and third generations grow up from migrant families in those countries, the expected tendencies for migrant roots to fade and force for host country ethnic identities to predominate. But this is not an automatic process. The US experience, for example, has uh, good examples of migrants retaining their ethnic identities and close ties with their respective motherlands. These identities and ties may remain robust after many generations or even become a steady source of national pride and solidarity through appropriate types of social institutions, organizations, and traditions. Many of these have developed closely with the anti-imperialist and democratic or revolutionary movements in the original homelands. Thank you, Professor Sison. again. Our sixth question for you is, do you think that national and social liberation movements should pay attention to arousing, organizing, mobilizing their compatriots who migrated to other countries? Can they, overseas compatriots, be considered a positive force for national revolution? Definitely, national and social liberation movements should pay attention to arousing, organizing, and mobilizing their compatriots who have migrated to other countries. The overseas compatriots are a positive force for the national revolution in, the, in their motherland. Marx and Engels living in exile in their own historical time, followed by Lenin and the Russian emigre revolutionaries had all experienced migrant life in other countries of Europe. Many Asian revolutionary leaders of the 20th century, such as Zhou Enlai, Zhu De, and Ho Chi Minh, also became politically active while working or studying in Europe, US, or Japan. They too saw the great value of arousing, organizing, and mobilizing their compatriots and support groups from other nationalities. Together with their respective proletarian parties, they relied on overseas mass organizations and encouraged all kinds of actions and linkages in support of the struggle in the homeland. Being aroused, organized, and mobilized to support the revolutionary struggle in their motherland, the overseas com compatriots can gather from among themselves moral and material support for the aforesaid struggle, as well as from the host people and other migrant peoples in the host country. Gathering moral support involves information and education campaigns and obtaining expressions of political and moral solidarity and support. Gathering material support involves realizing solidarity partnerships and exchange of publications and visits between organizations of the motherland and host country and obtaining financial, technical, and other forms of material assistance for the people in need. Thank you for that. Um, but we know, but for surely there are reactionary classes and revolutionary classes among overseas migrants. What then should be the guiding principle in organizing migrants? Indeed, there are reactionary classes and revolutionary classes among overseas migrants. We need to recognize the fact that there are migrants who belong to the exploiting classes, including highly paid diplomatic officials, business representatives, and top-level corporate professionals, and students of various ideological persuasions. But the overwhelming majority of migrants belong to the working class and lower middle class, they have a strong tendency to side with their own class, although it's often observed that rank and file migrant workers in an advanced capitalist country uh, may well display middle class lifestyles upon their return to the homeland. This is unsustainable. Generally, the objective material conditions and their exposure to class politics will continue to favor conditions for arousing, organizing, and mobilizing them. The guiding principle in organizing migrants is to bring them together in accordance with the national and democratic program. We need to promote and develop the United Front in which we rely mainly on the working people. 
winner of the intelligentsia and other urban petty bourgeois and take advantage of splits among the upper classes and reactionaries. While we are mindful of classes and the class tendencies of those who belong to them, let us be meticulous enough to know that there are individuals who do not think and behave according to their class origin. There are communists who have upper class origins. There are a few workers and students who are anti-communist and opposed to the national democratic movement. There are also individuals who do not know any better at some time, but who can be subsequently enlightened and become patriotic and progressive. Following that is, should the struggle of compatriots in host countries therefore be principally focused on supporting and contributing directly to the national liberation movement of their home country? How about the struggle for the rights and welfare of, communi of their communities in their host countries? I presume that most of uh, overseas compatriots, especially the wage earners, are preoccupied with their wage and living conditions and with paying attention to the rights and welfare of their community. They tend to join the trade unions of their host country when they are recruited, and also the Migrant Workers Association, which tends to be the biggest organization of migrants. We also recognize certain sectoral particularities among compatriots, such as among women and youth, who will have their distinct sectoral interests and issues. There can also be a strong interest in their homeland's culture, language, or ethnic traditions, or the even more particular issues and concerns of their home regions or hometowns. Within every form of migrant organization, there is a calibration and the focus of compatriots on supporting and contributing directly to the national liberation movement of their home country. At any rate, Compatriots who join our migrant organizations tend to be more concerned and militant about Philippine issues and the national liberation movement in the Philippines than those migrant compatriots who do not join the national democratic migrant organizations. Thank you, Professor. We just have a few more questions uh, left for you and then we'll move to the reactors. But we wanted to ask what contributions can overseas compatriots make to the advance of national and social liberation of their home countries. As I have earlier pointed out, the overseas compatriots can gather moral and material support from their own ranks and from the host people and other migrant peoples in order to contribute to the advance of the revolutionary struggle for national and social liberation in their countries. The contributions include expressions and concerted actions of anti-imperialist and democratic solidarity and proletarian international and uh, financial, uh, technical and other material forms of support and assistance. Uh, and just as they uh, can seek the support and uh, of uh, uh, the host people and other oh, people, for. they should be ready uh, to uh, extend solidarity and support uh, to them. Similarly, how can migrant organizations contribute to the anti-imperialist, anti-fascist, and democratic struggles in the host countries as well as internationally? The migrant organizations of various types can contribute to the anti-imperialist, anti-fascist, and democratic struggles in the host countries, as well as internationally by promoting and developing relations of solidarity and cooperation with the pertinent organizations according to class interest or social concern and by joining the International League of People's Struggle. Yes, uh, we hope they join. We have one last question. And this last question is, what is the role of the working class in the host countries in organizing migrants in relation to the liberation movements in sending countries? The working class in host countries has the role of organizing migrants, both for the purpose of building the working class movement in the host countries, encouraging them to support the revolutionary struggle in their homelands. The working class and uh, unions in advanced capitalist countries have an anti-fascist tradition and socialist aspirations, even as the monopoly bourgeoisie 
continues to subject them to imperialist, racist, and chauvinist propaganda uh, uh, in order to fracture and pit them against each other along racial, nationality, or ethnic uh, or immigrant lines. The working class movement must counteract the big bourgeoisie's divide and rule policies by stressing the commonality of the workers' economic and political struggles, meaning to say the struggles for trade union rights and the struggles for democracy and against imperialism. Thank you so much, Professor Sison, for those powerful and insightful responses to our question on today's topic. Um, we would now like to turn to our reactors, and we are first joined by Ms. Nilfer Koch, uh, born in Ardahan, Northern Kurdistan. Uh, she's a member of the Executive Council and spokesperson for the Commission on Foreign Relations of the Kurdistan National Congress, also known as Ken K. K and K. Her current primary political focus is the improvement of national dialogue amongst political parties and civil society organizations in Kurdistan. And she spent most of the period from 2013 to 2018 in Southern Kurdistan, um, Kurdistan, Iraq, and Rojava, Northeast Syria. Parallel to national unity efforts, Ms. Koch is also active in the international arena in raising awareness of the right to self-determination for the Kurdish people and all ethnic and religious components of Kurdistan. And she is interested and engaged in the active and autonomous participation of women in all fields of society and politics. Since 2011, Ms. Koch is working with the Kurdish women as well um, on the international level for the international legal and political recognition of femicide and feminicide as genocide. Ms. Koch came to Germany in 1976 as a child of Kurdish migrant workers and studied biology and political science at the University of Bremen. Welcome, Nilifer. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Paola. Um, and thank you for the organizers. It's a pleasure for me to be to here, and I was uh, and was a pleasure, an honor for me to listen to Professor Sison uh, to understand the general frame of the reason of uh, migrants and um, solution. What can the migrants do abroad? Um, as uh, Kurds, we have nearly five million migrants. Um, Two million are living in Europe. One million uh, in the former Soviet Union, and few thousand in the Arab countries like Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Yemen, and Sudan. And then we have also few ten thousand in Australia, Canada, and the U.S., and few thousand in South America. So as you see, it's a widespread of the Kurdish um, community abroad. Uh, uh, obviously, the migration in Kurdistan is a result of um, the dictatorship in the countries uh, which are colonizers of Kurdistan, like Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And the reason of the Kurdish migrants or migration is, of course, the war, uh, which is uh, still happening in our country, in our homeland. Uh, in the, since 2015, the numbers of migrants has increased, particularly those from Turkish part of Kurdistan. Uh, as you know, uh, Turkey is led by a fascist and dictator like Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And um, he is uh, committing a policy of genocide in Kurdistan. He wants to have a Kurdistan without Kurds. Uh, therefore, um, one side with the military, the military power, he is uh, evacuating Kurdish regions in Turkey, but also through the special warfare uh, which has a, a specific organization and manipulating people to leave the country to have a better future in Europe. This kind of special warfare is also happening um, or planned by the Turkish government. And also the migration from the North and East Syrian part of Kurdistan, particularly in Rojava, it's a serious problem now. In the beginning of year, Turkey was uh, weaponizing water so as you know, the water supplies for Syria and Iraq are springing from the Turkish part of Kurdistan. And Turkey built in the last year's dams on the rivers. 
And in the beginning of the year, when the people start to work with the, in the agriculture, they cut the water through the dams. Uh, so it caused problems of electricity and also water, drinking water, which were, became a crisis. And the aim of the Erdogan regime was to provocate the communities against the administration, uh, the autonomous administration of North and East Syria. Still, we have the problem to solve it. Uh, and also cutting the water supply to Iraq through the river of Tigris is a problem, which led the Arabic areas of Iraq becoming a problem. We have also uh, the problem of weaponizing of water by the Iranian regime. Uh, through the special channels they built on Kurdish rivers, uh, supplying water to the Persian areas, uh, which uh, led to poverty so people cannot work on their land, so they're forced to leave the homeland and um, there's also internal uh, migration to the Iranian cities like Tehran, the capital, also forced migration uh, of Kurds from Turkey to the Turkish cities, cities because the plan is if you force the Kurds, the Turkish, mainly Turkish inhabited cities like Istanbul, Ankara, it's easier to assimilate the Kurds. Um, so this is a result of the war we are facing. And uh, in the, also we have a problem now this year, particularly in the Iraqi part of Kurdistan and uh, the Kurdish leadership, the ruling class in Kurdistan, Iraq, are kind of Kurdish bourgeoisie uh, led by families and uh, the, um, the exploitation of the country uh, led to poverty even in the Iraqi part of Kurdistan, which is really a part of autonomy of federal Iraq. And this year, 28,000 people left Iraqi Kurdistan. A few thousand came recently to the Poland-Belarus um, uh, border. Uh, the aim was here to the forcing migration to Europe uh, through the Kurdish ruling class is also a uh, pro serious problem now. I would say stopping this kind of migration for us in first hand needs to overcome the Turkish fascism and the Turkish anti Kurdish problem. And Turkey, uh, for example, weaponizing water is, a, is accepted as a crime according to the international law. And also, Turkey has signed agreements with Iraq and Syria in 1963 to not to weaponize water. But as we know, no, none of the dictators are taking care of rules or agreements. They signed this happening also in Turkey. Uh, what we do when people came to Europe, particularly, or going to the Arab countries or to Caucasus or to Russia, we immediately organize the people through the organization we have everywhere. So the Kurds board have thousands of organizations. Immediately when they get uh, information that people came to refugee camps to in Germany, UK, France, wherever. So people are going, trying to politicize the migrants. And amongst them also people who have been politically active. The reason they left their country is because of the dictatorship and fascism in Turkey, particularly. When they come to European countries, they immediately take, continue with their political struggle. And the two million Kurds in Europe particularly, they are very active. And I would say uh, the Kurdish movement have achieved the biggest uh, migrant organization in Europe, particularly in Germany, because they're living 1.5 million Kurds. And, um, and these people have been politicized through the Kurdish freedom movement. And they understand that the Kurdish problem was caused by the European imperialist states led by France and Britain in the, in the 20th century. And what they do, every Kurd in Germany or in UK, in France became natural diplomats of Kurds. Uh, what they do is raising awareness about the Kurdish problem amongst the communities in the countries uh, where they live and keeping bridges with, <clears throat> with, the, with the organization who are also critical to the, uh, to the power, to the states. Let's say women's movements, uh, environmental movements, anarchists, anti-fascists, or working class. So the Kurds are trying to keep bridges also by them creating new forms of grassroots organization mixed by Kurds and non-Kurds in European countries. And the most uh, powerful part of the Kurds in the, dia in the board is Whenever something happening in Kurdistan, so you have few thousand people who are immediately able to be mobilized. 
Let's say we had a recently problem that Turkey used chemical weapons against the uh, Kurdish freedom fighters in Northern Iraq. So what they did was uh, mm, uh, protesting this in front of the organization which is responsible for controlling non-use of chemicals in The Hague in Netherlands. A few hundred Kurds immediately went there and uh, start to protest and write letters to the organizations so that Turkey is violating human rights, um, Turkey is violating international law by, use chemical, by the use of chemical weapons. And so, since 22 years, day and night, the Kurds are active in Strasbourg, which is the center of the Council of Europe and responsible for the prison island where the Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan has been held. Since 22 years, the Kurds are fighting in Strasbourg, bringing awareness to the responsibility of the Council of Europe where Turkey is a member. Um, and I would say after 22 years, in the end, this year we achieved to bring Öcalan's case uh, to the committee of the ministers of the council, which is the government of the Council of Europe. For after 22 years resistance in Strasbourg, we achieved to bring the, the cause of Öcalan to the agenda of the government of Council of Europe. So you see the migrants, when they are politicized and well organized, they can achieve a lot. It will take time. <laughs> and I think uh, the main reason why the European countries uh, who has tr mm, a trade relation with Turkey, diplomatic relation with Turkey, military relation with Turkey, why they keep silence in case of Turkey's uh, committing of war crimes, crimes against humanity in northern Syria, in I northern Iraq, and also in the uh, northern part of Kurdistan, Turkey, is that Turkey is still a very important or vital lack of the NATO in Middle East. So the main reason why they keep silent by the crimes committed by Turkey is that Turkey is the only Muslim state in the Middle East being member of the NATO. Uh, so Turkey is used to design the region according to the benefits of the imperialist states. And in these, the Kurds with the alternative, which they created already in the last 30 years or 40 years, I would say the model of democratic socialism in different parts of Kurdistan, the Kurds became a threat to the NATO with their alternative. Um, the, the peak of the success of the Kurdish revolution have become very known after the revolution in Rojava 2014, when Kurdish fighters defeated the, uh, by the imperial state created uh, army of the Islamic state. So the Kurds have been able to defeat the threat to humanity in, in, the Kurd in two parts of Kurdistan, in Northern Iraq and in Syria and Rojava. <clears throat> and also during the whole war, the Kurds have been able to, com to implement new solution uh, locally, but which can give also answer to many of the problems of the in the region. So the, the, for example, opening the gates also for domestic migration from Damascus, Ham, Hams and Raqqa uh, to the Kurdish region of Syria. Uh, politicizing them, giving them the free space for their own organization, but also at, um, um, organizing them bringing awareness of the coexistence of different ethnic groups. So this solution of coexistence of ethnic groups in Syria and in Turkey, which we are implementing, is of course a problem or the seek as seen as by the, by the imperialist states as a threat to their ideology, which is based on nationalism, manipulating the communities against each other. And we are moving against this um, um, ideology of the imperialist states. That's why uh, they brought the PKK on the list of terrorist organization uh, of the Euro European Union's list and the US list and also back in Germany. And so the power of the PKK to be able to also mobilize the 2 million Kurds in Europe and also the million in the former Soviet Union made it also powerful ab abroad. So I would say each Kurd who have been politicized by the movement is acting as a natural Kurdish diplomat, but uh, all, uh, all of them are organized in different um, organization according to their needs. We have organization of intellectuals in Europe, and then we have uh, nearly 12 Kurdish satellite TV channels, 
hundreds of Kurdish homepages. So uh, using the online world is also part of the new Kurdish struggle in Europe, particularly also in the in homeland. So I think organizing the migrants abroad uh, can also put pressure on the governments who caused the Kurdish problem in our homeland. These are the European countries and also the US, which is still under Joe Biden, seeking Turkey as a national ally of the NATO. Uh, so in, in, in the abroad, we have the, the opportunity uh, to um, build up a new grassroots organization with thousands of Europeans who are also critical to their own government's hegemonial policies. So I think um, uh, in this way, let's, uh, we, 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 for us it's important to make the migrants independent from the states in which they became refugees. So it means that we have to offer also uh, opportunities for them, for their needs, but they were in bureaucracy, in bureaucracy because applying for being a refugee. It's a long procedure of bureaucracy, so we have to help them. We have Kurdish lawyers organization who are taking care of these refugees. Um, and then whenever where there's a need of them, so we have to follow up the needs. And also the, the diaspora or the, the Kurds abroad are very important to finance the struggle in the homeland. Uh, so that um, Kurdish freedom movement can become independently uh, in economic way. So not being dependent on any of the states. Um, so that's why the role of the migra migrants in outside of the country is very important in um, financing uh, the struggle. And also whenever something happens in Kurdistan, Kurdistan now, now recently we have a problem of flood in different parts of Kurdistan, what is happening is that Kurds are collecting immediately money and sending them to the people in need in different parts of Kurdistan. When there was a reason, when there was a problem challenge of pandemic in North and East Syria, what was done was the Kurdish physicians uh, have sending medical uh, treatment uh, instruments to the region. So uh, this make the Kurdish movement at all very uh, independent in, uh, in all ways, I would say in any, in all fields of the needs. And uh, I think uh, it's a part of continuation of the revolution outside of the country. Uh, so wherever you, you have everywhere the model of democratic confederalism uh, in Europe, of course, in the frame of the law in Europe, and it's offering a lot of opportunities for organizing the migrants in European countries. And I think in the last 14, 40 years, I, I would say I would say the only uh, organization in Germany or in Europe which is not affected by state policy in, in the European countries is the Kurdish movement and the, the Kurdish movement who organize the migrant workers, the political refugees and the normal people who have become victims of a special warfare of Turkey and Iraq and Syria. Thank you Ms. Nilof. We have to wrap up in a minute or so. If you want to make any last comment in the last minute, uh, I, I agree with Professor Sisson's uh, statement or the analysis that, of course, the migration is a result of um, the imperialist uh, strategy of uh, designing the world from new. And our land, Kurdistan and Middle East, our Kurdistan spe spe specifically, but the whole Middle Eastern region became a center of the war. So there is power clashes between different uh, states, the US, Russia, China is now involved also, Turkey on the regional level, the, the competition between Iran and Turkey and the competition between Turkey and Arab states over the Kurdish land makes the problem very, very complicated. But the result is that uh, all agree to have a Kurdistan without Kurds. And for that, the special warfare, the military uh, clashes in the civilian areas, the use of Turkish drones, which attacking civilians um, directly in the city centers is a part of threatening the people, scaring the people to leave the country. So the migration problem in Kurdistan is a result of the war, which is also, which depends to the uh, imperialist strategy and implemented by Turkey as a, ally of the NATO in the region. And I, will, I would say the Kurds are not the only victims of this pro, pro, uh, problem. 
Turkey is also active in Northern African countries, uh, bringing everywhere uh, uh, destabilization and also military intervention in Yemen, in Sudan, and also creating problems, uh, social problems to, to the Islam as a political instrument in Egypt, in Lebanon, everywhere in North Africa and Middle East. So uh, it's not the issue just of the Turkish have side. You have to see Turkey as a continuation of the NATO's policy in Middle yeah. East um, to have create Middle East as a headquarter for the NATO's strategy towards Asia Pacific. So in this, um, we, we have to come together since uh, our problems can be solved if we are in a stronger way of in solidarity. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Nilufer Koch, for those comments and the messages of solidarity, the role of migrants abroad from Kurdistan, connecting with the struggle in the homeland, uh, Kurdistan, and throughout the region also, the analysis. So very powerful comments, the reactions to Professor Sison's powerful insights and responses to our questions. Uh, so we want everyone in the forum today to prepare your questions. There will be a question and answer portion. Hopefully we have enough time for uh, a few questions. So you can either uh, prepare the questions to share yourself or put them in the chat box and we will be able to compile the questions for our main speaker, Professor Sison and the reactors. Uh, but we now like to turn to uh, Gabriela Malaspin. Uh, she was the co-chairperson of New York Boricua Resistance, uh, which, focus, which has a focus on the issues happening on the archipelago of Puerto Rico. New York Boricua Resistance is an organization that exists to educate, organize, and mobilize the Puerto Rican diaspora and its allies in New York City towards an independent and anti-capitalist Puerto Rico. Gabriela. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me well? Okay. Thank you so much. I'm incredibly honored to be here. I'm incredibly honored to um, listen to all these speakers. Um, uh, and thank you all so much. Um, I want to use this as an opportunity to circle back to one of uh, Professor Jose Maria Sison's points, how migration is not voluntary, but rather forced. This is especially clear in Puerto Rico for 123 years, the United States, in conjunction with Puerto Rico's puppet government, has enacted policies for the benefit of American imperialists to the detriment of Puerto Ricans in the archipelago. In the 1940s, the US rapidly industrialized um, Puerto Rico as part of a program uh, referred to as Operation Bootstrap. Um, Operation Bootstrap was designed to turn Puerto Rico into kind of an attractive destination for um, American and foreign investors. Um, and they did this by implementing like lucrative tax benefits, reorient reorienting Puerto Rico into a tourism based economy and implementing rapid industrialization. Um, and while this provided economic growth for a period of time, uh, what this did is it created a reliance on foreign um, and foreign investment and on a reliance on multinational national entities that was unsustainable for Puerto Rico, as also, um, as you'll see kind of later into the twenty into the twenty first century. Um, so the United States also recognized that while Operation Bootstrap was like creating this economic boom, the United States also recognized that they needed to incentivize Puerto Ricans to leave the island um, to control the population and ensure that this like Puerto Rico remained a playground for investors. So the federal government began sponsoring mass, mass migrations to New York City and other places throughout the Northeast of the United States for Puerto Ricans to work in uh, industries such as cigar factories, textiles, and farms. This is why you see such a, a significant concentration of Puerto Rico, of Puerto Ricans in um, areas such as Bushwick, New York. Um, around this time, there's also like the more vi like the more violent elements of this type of displacement, um, where you have United U.S. doctors um, sterilizing about 40 40 percent of Puerto Rican women and enacting and um, enacting experiment birth control experimentation on Puerto Rican women. Um, so both to keep the population under control, um, as they would say, um, and to ensure that there are effective workers that would not have to rely on childcare. Um, essentially kind of implementing genocidal policies. Um, today, we are facing another wave of mass migration in Puerto Rico. As of 2018, over 60% of Puerto Ricans live in the United States compared to only 30% who live in Puerto Rico. 
In the last decade alone, Puerto Rico has lost over 11% of its population. Um, it was in 2006 that the number of overseas compatriots in the United States surpassed the number of those in the archipelago. Um, this was due to a number of factors. As I kind of mentioned earlier, Operation Bootstrap made us um, a dependent on foreign investment. And when they eliminated some of these tax exemptions like the 936 tax exemptions, um, many US manufacturing companies um, left Puerto Rico. Um, because they can no longer benefit from these tax incentives. Um, and it is exactly the crisis of capitalism and colonialism under the US that forces so many Puerto Ricans to leave. This is further exacerbated by the imposition of the Fiscal Control Board, also known as La Junta de Control Fiscal. Um, a group that is appoint, um, this is a group that's appointed by the American government. It is unelect not elected by the people of Puerto Rico. Um, this primary, oh, sorry. Sorry about that, please continue, Gabriella. And if uh, participants can remember to mute your microphones. Sorry about that, Gabriella. Oh, no worries. Um, sorry, where are they? Um, so uh, essentially, this fiscal control board ensures that we pay our $72 billion debt by slashing social services. Um, so hundreds of schools have been closed down. Uh, hospital wings have shuttered. Um, our electrical grid has been privatized by this American Canadian venture called Luma. Um, and austerity policies are the primary reason why people have left. Um, as highlighted before, this isn't, um, when you talk to Puerto Ricans who have left the, who have left the archipelago, um, they'll largely say they left because um, the wage, wages on the island were low compared to what you can find in, in, in the American core. Um, there's so many heart-wrenching stories of families with special needs children who have had to leave Puerto Rico because there isn't enough investment in, in services to serve um, children or people with special needs. Um, and they're often unable to access the services they need. Um, or they've left because our infrastructure has deteriorated to a point where people feel unsafe on the island in the event of a natural disaster, as we saw with um, events like Hurricane Maria and the multiple earthquakes that happened into early 2020. Um, and um, I want to highlight how reforms are not and have never, like, you know, reforms to address the migration crisis are not and have never worked in Puerto Rico. Um, often these reforms uh, rely on like creating additional tax incentives or maybe um, providing additional money to like small businesses. Um, during the time of Hurricane Maria, the government sponsored a campaign called Yo No Me Quito, uh, which roughly translates to I Won't Leave. Um, and while this was a campaign that supposedly was going to extol the virtues of remaining in Puerto Rico, its true purpose was to alienate the archipelago from the diaspora by implying that those who had left the island didn't care about Puerto Rico. Um, they used this campaign to foster contempt between those who, were, who remained on the island and those who left, effectively weakening our revolutionary efforts. Currently, the government has considered various tax incentives to entice Puerto Ricans to stay on the island, yet these reforms are a farce. It is impossible to achieve economic sustainability for the people of Puerto Rico while under American colonialism. Um, and we see this, uh, for example, pharmaceutical corporations and multinational entities make billions of dollars on the island and reap billions of dollars in profits, yet that money never trickles down to the general population. Uh, we have had tax benefits like Act 20 and Act 22 to entice white colonizers to live here for, for more than a decade. Yet a report from El Centro de Periodismo Investigativo from Puerto Rico concluded that after more than a decade of these policies, little if any of the wealth these recipients has, have created for themselves has been reinvested in the local economy. We have been taught for centuries that the reason why Puerto Rico faces poverty is because we don't try hard enough. But, but this is a lie. It's because American imperialists have turned Puerto Rico into a tax haven for the rich at the expense of the people. Social revolution is the only solution for Puerto Rico. It is only by abolishing the different colonial structures, such as the fiscal, um, such as the fiscal control board, the tax codes that benefit wealthy investors, the debt crisis, et cetera, 
that we will achieve true liberation and prosperity as a people. It is only when we eliminate capitalism and imperialism on the island and attain our independence as a nation that we will be truly free. I want to highlight that as Professor Jose Maria Sison indicated, overseas compatriots play a critical role in, our, in their home countries. In the case of Puerto Rico, it is essential for like the diaspora and the island to be able to come together and unite in our revolutionary efforts. Um, with more than 60% uh, of people of Puerto Ricans living in the diaspora, we must continue to strengthen our links. Um, we, there are so many of the colonial entities are located in the United States. Today, right now, we're actually mobilizing against the Fiscal Control Board in New York City at uh, One Bowling Green. Um, many of the vulture funds are located around Midtown Manhattan. Um, Daily, I see signs that revolutionary efforts in Puerto Rico are growing in power. The students of the University of Puerto Rico have consistently been on strike against the privatization of our electrical grid. Tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans marched in the streets when power outages caused by Luma occurred. We managed to oust Governor Ricardo Rosselló in 2019, and in 2020 was the first time that neither of the major political parties achieved, more, achieved less than 40% of the popular vote. Revolution is possible and it is happening right before our eyes. Lastly, I want to emphasize how we must continue to work in conjunction with other movements for liberation across the globe and how anti-imperialist organizations are key to this. The International League of People's Struggles allows us to connect with comrades around the world and build alongside each other. Here in NYC, we have forged close relationships with overseas compatriots from Mexico, Palestine, the Philippines, and many other struggles. We recognize that if one of us is not free, none of us are free. My hope is that the links between the diaspora and the archipelago will continue to strengthen across time and our revolutionary efforts can be amplified. I want us to continue building with other liberation movements and always practice the principle of international solidarity. I truly see we will see liberation for Puerto Rico and international liberation within my lifetime. Thank you all. Thank you, Gabriela, for those remarks, um, your reminders and updates on how Puerto Ricans are affected by migration as a result of centuries and decades of continued U US imperialism. Um, we truly do wish to see Puerto Rico libre one day in our lifetime. Um, we'll continue on to our third and final reactor, who is Mohamed Khatib. He is the European coordinator uh, for the Semidun uh, Solidarity Network for Palestinian Political Prisoners and a member of the follow-up committee for the Palestinian Alternative Revolution Revolutionary Path Movement. We turn it over to you now, Mohammed. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, comrades. Uh, thank you, Paula and Terry, and uh, thanks for ILPS Commission 15 for organizing this very important event and bringing us together from Palestine to Puerto Rico to Kurdistan to the Philippines and many others. And I think this is exactly the role of diaspora and this is how the Filipino community and the Filipino National Liberation Movement, ILPS, uh, NDF and all others organizations are teaching us this very important how uh, our community and relating our local struggle, national struggle with the, our diaspora community struggle. Uh, and also it's very interesting to hear from uh, Comrade Nulfer uh, from the Kurdistan movement. Uh, we always learn from their example and the way they organize and they struggle in Europe. Also, we are in full solidarity with those organizations who are facing criminalization for their local organizations in diaspora uh, from the Kurdistan movement and many other or political organizations who represent a national liberation movement, especially who use armed struggle as a defense of their uh, people's struggle back home and international uh, borders. Uh, also, I want to comment how uh, the significant or one of the significant cases for the Palestinian community that we were uprooted from our homeland in 1948. Uh, for example, me, me, myself, I was born in a refugee camp called Al Helwi refugee camp in Lebanon, where our community in Lebanon have no right to work, have no right to uh, for housing. Uh, we are locked in refugee camps until today. So even us as a Palestinian who were de uh, deported uh, to the Arab borders who lived in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. We face also this Arab reactionary regime, racist and sectarian regimes policy 
and this is affecting our community on daily basis. Uh, so can you imagine the Palestinian community of Lebanon who have been refugees for more than 70 years, have no right to work and who have no right even for a real movement. Uh, our refugee camp and the Helwi camp, it's a one kilo square meter, uh, but we have 150,000 inhabitants. Uh, it's a camp siege by a wall and the uh, wires from the Lebanese army and checkpoints. You cannot get in and south and outside this camp without passing to the Lebanese army and the Lebanese intelligence checkpoints, which is very similar to the apartheid policy that the Zionist regime is using against our people uh, in West Bank and Gaza and in Palestine occupied 1948. Uh, uh, but also after the war in Syria and after the revolution and after all the changes in our region and in the Middle East, after the economical crisis in Lebanon, after the siege in Gaza, our community newly became uh, a new arrivals as of refugees uh, they were deported for the second and third time uh, to Europe. So today we have a huge community in Germany, we have a huge Palestinian community in Scandinavia, uh, in general, in Sweden, in Denmark. Uh, we have a huge Palestinian community in the United States. We always have a huge Palestinian uh, community in uh, Latin America. And of course, historically, our community played a very important role of organizing our people in diaspora, connecting our people back home, supporting our people who are doing the Intifada first in Intifada and Second Intifada, supporting economically, sending delegations, making awareness, but this was never enough. And this was never really uh, benefitable for our people who struggle back home. That's why we have rise of a Palestinian right wing in Latin America. We have a, some Palestinian who are going to elections as a ministers who are fascist, who are Palestinians. But at the same time, when they are talking about Palestine, they are progressive and leftist because it's easier for them to be as a Palestinian uh, leftist, but back home because there where he is making money and he is affiliated with a certain class, then he is defending his privilege as a migrant. So it's not only the migrants who can also play a very important role. Also, it's a, the working class issue. We have a Palestinian migrant bourgeoisie class who are yani, involved with the Zionist enemy regime. And they are the one who are involved of building the Palestinian Authority who are also today is coordinating in security level with the Zionist enemy. So we have a Palestinian Zionist class as well who are part of the diaspora and playing a contradiction to our people movement. But also as Comrade Juma Sison, the interest always and the bigger majority of our people who are the minimum like the under classes and the poor people and the new arrivals of refugees who are uh, uh, yeah, was born and third generations of uh, of refugees but also this is very interesting for us as palestinians we think also as much as we have to connect our struggle uh, with the, our national borders and back home but also uh, we understand very well who is our enemy and we don't see the European Union or the United States of America as a two regimes who are supporting the Zionist regime. Who is occupying us in Palestine? They are white settlers coming from Canada, New Zealand, the United States, Germany, France, and Belgium. They are white, white settlers. So our enemy is in Europe. Our, we see Tel Aviv and the Zionist movement based in France, based in Germany, based in New York. And this makes us for uh, yeah, this is push us as a Palestinian to yeah, to fight this uh, enemy everywhere because we, we it's not uh, logical for us to lock ourselves in our small ghettos and cities and to fight this imperialist powers that uh, all of the yeah, coming from all around the world occupying this small homeland and then we are based in their countries and then we are used as a cheap labor and as a slaves to serve their economy that they are using the same economy to occupy and colonize us and then they turn us as a generator of a fact this big factory and machine of colonialism and blender so we see a big role for our community to be part of the local struggle to be part of the uh, local and social organizations to connect with the other national liberations movement organizations who are based in the home country uh, but at the same time uh, to take seriously uh, the strategy of fighting and, and deporting 
the conflict and the contradiction from our homeland to the enemy homeland. And this is, uh, we think, the main role of our future community that have to play and the generations of Palestinians who are growing up uh, abroad and in, in the diaspora uh, to create this national liberation uh, program for us as a Palestinian, but also where we play a very important role to defeat the enemy from their homeland, not us, not only over ourselves. And thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Mohammed. A lot of us have been fighting alongside our Palestinian siblings in places all over the world for the liberation of Palestine and in solidarity with all of our people's struggles. Uh, we want to thank you and also to all of the reactors and of course to our main speaker, Professor Jose Maria Sison, for giving us such powerful insights on the topic of today's forum. Uh, we want to remind folks to go ahead and, and chat uh, in the chat box, uh, pose some of your questions. We have, we're about an hour and a half into the forum. So we'll have to wrap up and, and can only entertain a few questions. We actually had a video about the Palestinian struggle from uh, some filmmakers in Canada that we wanted to share. But what we hope to do is to share that video with the remarks of Professor Sison and all of the reactors with you all after today's forum. So you have the wealth, uh, the benefit of the wealth of their knowledge and their perspectives on waging struggle uh, at home and abroad. Um, so if folks have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box. They can be posed to our main speaker, Professor Sison, or any of the reactors. And we have a few prepared uh, just in case, but uh, uh, Paula and I will just uh, ask a couple of them. Um, I think particularly there's a couple for um, Mohammed and also for Gabriella, and then we can see if we have time for more questions than that, and also for Professor Sison and Ilifer as well. Um, so I have an initial one that we uh, prepared for uh, Gabriella. Uh, the current demands or calls of the Puerto Ricans or Boricuans in the diaspora, a New York Borico resistance and other chapters of Borico resistance have been um, uh, growing in different parts of the United States. The fiscal board that you mentioned that's governing Puerto Rico is in New York right now. I heard this in action today. So again, the role of the organizers and the migrants right here today in New York and other parts uh, have a big role to play and we'll be protesting the fiscal board in here in New York. But what are the current calls and demands uh, or maybe the specific demands on the fiscal board um, uh, from the New York Puerto Rico resistance? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so our current demands are, well, um, for example, it's, about, it's not just to abolish the fiscal control board, um, it's also to abolish our debt and to, enact reparations for the people of Puerto Rico because we it's this is an elite not only is this an illegal debt but we have been consistently like um American imperialists have consistently extract, extracted profit from us for 123 years uh we demand like our full independence and the about like the abolition like the about abolition of a capitalist system in Puerto Rico um and we we demand we demand um, restitution for all the historical injustice that has been done to us. So, um, such as you know the forced sterilization of Puerto Rican women, um, the um, the murder of our political prisoners. We demand liberation for our political prisoners. Um, so, I think those would kind of encapsulate our main demands as NY Boricua resistance, and particularly like many anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist organizations in the diaspora. Thank you, Gabriela. We also have a question from Mohammed. Um, it is, how are the Palestinian, how are the Palestinian migrants um, helping in the International Criminal Court (ICC) case against Israel and the U.S. government? Well, it's a very long question for me uh, because we don't like there is no any involvement really in reality for the Palestinian community in raising up these topics or putting out this strategies that the Palestinians want to go to the international court against Israel or to the international, uh, yes. I think it, this is the uh, game that the Palestinian Authority is playing in its national like foreign uh, policy and a way telling the Palestinians that we are going against Israel. Uh, but in fact, when this case will be open in the international court, for example, 
uh, this will be open against Israel and the Palestinians, and the investigation will be against this, like and what Israel did and what the Palestinian did. Uh, the Palestinian people are helping and organizing demonstrations and organizing Hamas uh, organizations uh, on raising the question of the Palestinian political prisoners, uh, getting involved more in the boycott movement and pushing the uh, Western communities and the local host community where they live is to boycott Israel, trying to get involved with the already exist uh, solidarity organizations for Palestine. When we came recently, for example, to Germany, uh, we saw as a Palestinian or to Greece, for example, as a Palestinian refugee coming from Syria, we saw already that there is a solidarity movement for Palestine led by the Greek uh, left movement and the communist movement and the trade unions and also the Kurdish who already exist in Greece since long time and they are struggling for Kurdistan and Palestine. So we saw this, we learned from those examples. Not all of our community was exposed uh, to the joint struggle between international uh, diaspora communities coming from a different uh, orientations. And this helps us that Today, I can say uh, the normal Palestinian local popular classes who were locked in refugee camps in the last 70 years uh, through this catastrophe and through this forced migration to Europe, uh, but gladly our community today is connecting socially uh, with the Kurdish people, with some Filipino people. Uh, they are exposed uh, to other uh, struggles and forms of struggles. So I think this is how it's helping our people by getting them more involved in struggling for Palestine. If you are a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon, locked in a refugee camp, similar to a slum, that you have no food and you have no right to work, how you struggle for Palestine? If you don't have electricity and water and basics, how, what do you do in your life? You, you are struggling to feed yourself. So you have no space to think for Palestine. There was always thinking within the Palestinian traditional right-wing class spreading within the National Liberation Movement, especially led by Fatah, that if you leave this refugee camp and if you go to Europe and anywhere else, you are a traitor and you are leaving your people and you are not committed with your community and you have no commitment for Palestine. The hist what happened showed us the opposite. In the moment when our people arrived to Germany, coming from the siege of Yarmouk camp, and were bombed for two years or more, they came and started joining any protest for Palestine. Entire families, they are coming and joining as a family, as the, the whole household, as coming and joining, for example, a solidarity uh, events or demonstrations. And there they are exposed to the black struggle, to the racism struggle, because, and now they are facing another kind of questions. So I think this is how really the Palestinian people are and have to be involved in struggle, not pushing our cause to be in the United Nations and EU institutions and this, because those institutions, we see them as the main enemy of the Palestinian people, not as the one who will give us justice. Thank you, Mohammed, for, you know, that very sobering um, reflection on the role of us as migrants and as diaspora and from one diasporic person to another, I just, um, send my solidarity and my love to all Palestinian refugees as well. Um, we also have a question for Nilofer. Um, how are the seceding generations of displaced Kurdish people developed to get involved in the struggle? We have now the fourth generation of the Kurdish migrants in the European countries. Through cultural work and folkloristic work, uh, we do organize, we are beginning with the children until the adults. And we have also recently started to build up Kurdish kindergarten uh, to teach in Kurdish, um, different Kurdish dialects, not just Kurmanji, but also other dialects. What is important to build our own system according to the legal opportunities in each European country. This is very important for us because we are not looking for a way of confrontation with the states. Since the war is happening in our country, the problem is that the solution must be in the country itself. But what the role of the, um, the migrants or the, our community abroad is to stretch in the revolution. At the back uh, stage of the revolution, the migrants. So, um, but also uh, taking care that none of the Kurds uh, has to be assimilated by the European culture. 
And uh, secondly, uh, the people have to, to understand, even the children have to understand why their parents left the country, where they come from. All the ways it's important for us, us to have the bridge to our roots, where we come from and why we came to the different foreign countries. Um, and uh, the generation we have, uh, we have organization for Kurdish students everywhere in Europe. We have organization of Kurdish academic, academicians everywhere, uh, special, special women uh, academic, academies. Uh, and also uh, when there are social problems in the families, uh, Kurdish families, for example, domestic violence against women, we have our own houses for women. So it's, imp it's important to be organized autonomously in each state. So to keep your people always mobilized for their country, the homeland, but also um, providing for their needs. So whatever it's financially, because we have also Kurdish, organized Kurdish business people uh, who, have, who have to support those who are in need. And by organizing this kind of organization prevent our people from the European racism. You know, the migrants are used by the right wing um, parties and movements in all European countries. And right wing is a, is a kind of result of uh, the imperialist uh, competition between each state. And as, as uh, Professor Sison raised, uh, one of the main uh, instruments for keeping the migrant silence is the increase of the right wing in each European country. Uh, so we are preventing our people to be affected by these. And if there's any can, any can attack against the curse, like it was happened a few years ago in Germany when the German fascists attacked some, um, uh, I think it was a cafeteria by, run by Arab, and they, he killed many of the Kurds and Arabs in the cafeteria. What we did, we are still following this case. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is important to keep the, the, the consciousness of our people so that these are people with value because the European racism is attacking you as the undeveloped people. Whether in Germany, France, and you see uh, the increase of right-wing parties and uh, the, this right-wing issue using the migrants as a problem in their policy and their strategy is also a state policy to cover the real reason of unemployment amongst the German or the French or the UK right. citizens unemployment. So uh, fighting against this is also one of our duties to explain to people that, money, that through racism, nationalism, the state is want to defend the capitalism and the results of capitalism uh, as a form of unemployment, uh, depression in the society, which is now increasing through the pandemic uh, process of pandemic. Uh, so this is uh, always bringing awareness among the people, teaching them through TV channels, whatever is needed. So keeping them always active. But the main problem, we never use the terminology of diaspora. We always say abroad. We never That's say right. diaspora. So because we say you have to go back to your country. The, the solution is in our country, not in Europe. So Europe is the place where our homeland became a problem like um, Comrade Mohammed raised um, also. So the Kurdish coast or the Palestinian coast um, is created by the Europeans, by the South speaker Agreement, by the Lausanne Treaty, whatever you call it. So several conferences have been done after the first world war to divide our countries, to bring it under the control of some colonial states. Uh, so that I think the diaspora, since the Kurdish movement has a huge sympathy, particularly after the revolution in Rojava, so uh, support is really growing amongst particularly the young Europeans. And I think there's also so solidarity, strong solidarity for the Palestinians. What can be useful for the future is to bring more the Kurdish and the Palestinian migrants together in the European countries. So since the source of the problem is the same center, the solution has to be then created by us when we come together and strengthen our solidarity. I think this is very important, uh, particularly in Europe or even in the US, there's also the Kurdish huge number of, of Kurds. Exactly, and here we are today. Um, you know, Paula and myself here in the United States very much identify with what you talked about. We are the succeeding generations and that cultural development, 
the participation in the struggle of our homelands and the solidarity between our movements uh, from Palestine to Puerto Rico to El Salvador, the Philippines, Kurdistan uh, is represented today. We have um, one last question. So thank you all for sharing that for Professor Sison. Um, you know, uh, we wanted to ask in particular, um, uh, many mentioned the different struggles and opportunities for the role of overseas compatriots. Uh, we want to ask you uh, uh, for this question and also to give closing comments. This will be the last question. Um, what is the role of overseas compatriots in national elections in the home country? Uh, the Philippine elections are coming up, the recent El Salvadoran elections, CSPES has been active on that. So what's the role of overseas compatriots in national elections in home countries like the upcoming one in the Philippines? And then if you want to add any closing remarks and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, the uh, overseas Filipinos have a role to play uh, in connection with the national elections uh, in the Philippines, uh, uh, such as the one that's now coming up uh, for um, to 2022. <clears throat> they do not only have a role to play, they have uh, the right and duty and yeah, to play that role, uh, they can uh, certainly they can um, um, express themselves on the nature of the electoral process, and then they, they can comment on the character uh, of uh, the political parties and candidates running, and uh, they have the right uh, also to vote if they wish to vote. Um, you know the. Um, the embassies and uh, the, uh, the the embassies and and uh, consulates of the reactionary government uh, uh, are supposed to administer um, uh, overseas voting by Filipinos. Now, uh, let me explain um, uh, the importance of uh, 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 the role as well as the right and duty of Filipinos to uh, uh, express themselves and uh, even. Uh, to vote, no? So um, uh, they must uh, have form an opinion on the character of the entire electoral process. It is one dominated by the exploiting classes, particularly now, particularly by a, um, by a kind of regime that you cannot trust, no? It is a traitorous, tyrannical, um, mass murdering, plundering, and swindling kind of regime, the Duterte regime. You cannot trust uh, Duterte that he, he would uh, um, uh, keep the elections clean and honest as he promised to uh, Biden, no? Joe Biden, uh, who scandalously invited him to a soap uh, to a pretentious summit on democracy. Huh? So you have to you have an imperialist pretender to democracy, and you have a a, a, um, a fascist puppet, no, uh, pretender to democracy. So uh, it's important for Filipinos to express themselves on the character and uh, what are the main features of this kind of electoral process in the Philippines. Now. Um, and then it's important to, you know, to go uh, to the details. What kind of parties are running? And then what are the candidates? Uh, uh, are there? Certainly you can make a general conclusion that the general run of political parties um, uh, and um, candidates that, that run for the highest positions uh, are uh, overwhelmingly reactionary. You can only find, uh, you can only see a few uh, anti-imperialist or uh, patriotic and uh, uh, democratic personalities running for, uh, let's say, the Senate. You have uh, Neri Colmenares and um, uh, Elmer Labog and uh, uh, you have also the progressive party list groups uh, uh, belonging to the Macabayan bloc, no? Um, 
But uh, observe uh, that the party list groups which used to yield uh, some uh, uh, six to eight uh, members of Congress, the, of the lower house of Congress, uh, have, been, um, have been hijacked by the political dynasties. And you so you know, uh, I will not be surprised if Duterte will do something, uh, uh, something so bad, no worse, something worse than you know reducing uh, what used to be ten Makabayan uh, members of Congress to just uh, I don't know, probably six, six to eight, no. Yeah, he can uh, he can wipe out the entire uh, Makabayan uh, candidates. That's a possibility. So. Uh, uh, then uh, you might ask the question, why as a revolutionary, I should be opening eh, uh, the, uh, to the possibility of voting in this kind of uh, uh, electoral system? Well, the revolutionary movement um, uh, has a dual uh, revolutionary policy uh, involving uh, dual tactics towards uh, uh, processes of, uh, of, of, the, of the class enemy. Um, if you were a flag carrier of the Communist Party, it would be very wrong for you eh? Eh? To, uh, uh, to put up a, camp, a party or run for a position in this kind of uh, uh, ruling system in the Philippines. Uh, to participate in the in this type of election, no? if you were an op if a flag carrier and uh, openly known communist revolutionary, you cannot participate. In the first place, you are banned from participating. It's not if it's it's not uh, even your uh, uh, fault that uh, you are not participating. In the first place, the class enemy bans you from the system. So that should be clear. But then um, uh, there are two kinds of united front that is possible in the revolutionary movement. No? In the main, you have a united front for armed struggle. Uh, uh, that is the main kind of uh, united front that the uh, uh, CPP and other revolutionary forces are carrying out. No? But there is also another kind of united front that is subordinate to that. That is the legal united front. No? Uh, but anyway, uh, whether you talk about uh, a united front for armed struggle or for legal struggle, uh, you must uh, consider um, how you carry that out according to the class line. So uh, in the united front, it's the working class uh, that is the leading class. And it is based mainly on the basic alliance of the working class and the peasantry. That's the first part, no? That's the most important part. Then you win over the middle forces, usually in, in class terms, usually the uh, urban petty bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie. Then another part is to take advantage of the splits among the reactionaries. You take advantage in many ways. Yeah? Um, the stupid Trotsky, I think that if you know, if you take advantage of splits among your enemy, among the reactionaries, <laughs> then you, uh, you, you become uh, a part of the enemy class. Or let's say if you, if you uh, try to win over the middle forces, Ah, you, you submit yourself to petty bourgeois uh, ideology, or you submit to yourself to um, uh, national bourgeois economic interest. No, that's a stupid thinking. Um, the very integrity of the revolutionary movement uh, is first led by uh, the theory and practice of the working class. And then the most reliable base of of uh, the of uh, the working class is its basic alliance with the peasantry. Okay, the fourth part is why do you uh, go through these uh, 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 parts of the United Front? No, it is to isolate, weaken, and destroy the enemy one by one. No? 
uh, be that enemy, a local uh, uh, reactionary force or an aggressor force. Eh? Um, the objective, the fourth part is to um, realize the objective of the United Front. Now, of course, in the United Front for Arms Struggle, that is something decided by arms. Then in the, in the struggle, in the United Front for Legal Struggle, um, uh, uh, you uh, take advantage of the pretenses of the enemy for democracy, and still, because people, many people from various classes still go to the elections, um, it's good to avail eh, of the, uh, that process somehow, eh, without uh, uh, dropping your revolutionary principle, you allow people, no? uh, you allow people uh, to act in a way uh, that is best for themselves. No? Um, let, it, let us put it this way. Uh, when you really do mass work, uh, um, uh, you meet workers and peasants. Don't think that they were born communists or revolutionaries. <laughs> they, they, they have all kinds of ideas. Huh? They believe in the Catholic Church and so on and so forth. So many, all sorts of ideas. Now, it is the challenge to the... Um, uh, to the communist cater or the revolutionary mass activists to explain things. You learn from them. First, their conditions and needs, then you will be able to explain eh, uh, uh, what constitutes a higher level of consciousness for their own good. No? Uh, you cannot just assume that the, the workers and peasants are, are born revolutionaries. You have to do the work. You are a lazy... Uh, um, uh, infantilist Maoists, no? eh, those who, who don't do, do hard work except write on, online, uh, they think to make, to make revolutionists, you know, simply to discover them as pure Maoists eh, without any kind of <laughs> without any kind of social investigation <laughs> and uh, educational work. No? So, uh, uh, how is it that in the real world, no? Why, uh, why can't the Filipino communist uh, um, uh, uh, decide to swim, to swim the Pacific Ocean uh, to, to go to the U.S. because he doesn't like uh, airlines uh, owned by monopolies? That's stupid. Um, in the first place, the airline company is constituted mainly by workers and so on and so forth. And just because it is owned by the monopoly capitalists, are you going eh, to, to do eh, uh, something stupid like swimming the Pacific Ocean to go to the US? No. Um, as a matter of fact, an NPA fighter gets the M16 manufactured by the US in order to kill, uh, in order to finish off uh, uh, US aggressor troops and puppet troops. No? You get means, eh? you get means from the enemy to defeat your enemy. And uh, that's exactly what the exploiting class does. No? Um, uh, the capitalist takes advantage of the labor power of the worker in order to extract the surplus value. And you know, uh, the working class has all the right, has all the right to reclaim the total value. And um, of, of their own work and administer uh, administer society according to socialism, but you have to struggle for that. And there are stages to go through. So, um, and this is my way of explaining uh, why uh, some uh, the Communist Party does not waste its time uh, telling people don't go to the elections. You know, it's either a boycott or participation. No. Um, uh, the electoral process in the Philippines can be used uh, by the communists behind the scenes eh? uh, in order to turn things against uh, the class, against uh, the enemy. Uh, but never should the Communist Party endorse the, uh, the dominant electoral process as something good. No, uh, it is a, uh, it is a, 
It is a, a matter of turning the enemy's weapon against the enemy. And it's like seizing the armor light no? from uh, the enemy troop in order to, to shoot him no? uh, subsequently. So that's the so, so much uh, discussion on the United Front. Now, um, the, the overseas Filipinos um, can uh, um, uh, be encouraged by Filipino mass organizations in foreign countries to uh, speak up and, um, uh, and comment on the electoral process as a whole and uh, how it's likely going to be rigged. Yeah? You know, it's important to, to say right away that the election, electoral process is going to be rigged. Yeah? But uh, you give the various forces still believing in the elections to do their best on opposing uh, Duterte. And when Duterte uh, does the rigging, uh, then uh, the people will be ready to rise up as uh, the Filipino did in 1986. Uh, they rose up against Marcos. So you cannot uh, get the people to be angry about the elections if, they, if, uh, the, uh, if most of the people uh, believed in the elections, they went to the elections and they don't get frustrated. Uh, you, don't, you, you don't get a big mass of uh, people who are outraged, ready to do their best against the rigging and the results of the, uh, of the elections. That's what I would say about uh, how important uh, uh, Filipinos uh, uh, being able to speak up uh, against the electoral process, uh, speaking well of the, of the few better candidates and denouncing um, the whole electoral process and the, um, the uh, uh, role of the Duterte uh, ruling clique. So uh, I hope uh, <laughs> that exhausts the, the, uh, the answer to the question. Yes, uh, we could probably have another two hours <laughs> discussion on this and many of the topics that were brought up today, but I'll turn it to Paula. We're gonna go ahead and wrap up, but thank you for those closing comments, uh, Professor Sison. Yes, thank you so much for making us think about how we engage with the electoral processes, you know, in our homelands and um, where we are. Um, that's all the time we have for now, though, but we hope to obviously continue these conversations moving forward and to continue building together. Um, we wanted to express our appreci appreciation to everyone who joined us today. We had over 150 participants from around the world for over two hours, actually. Um, we wanted to thank, I wanted to thank personally, uh, Terry, my co-facilitator, and we wanted to thank uh, our, the organizers, the interpreters, the tag team, and of course, Professor Sison and our reactors, Nilifer, Gabriela, and Mohammed, um, who, who were just wonderful throughout this. Um, but before we before we end, we'd like to take a group picture before we stop the live stream. Um, this will be voluntary, so you can turn your camera off or on. Yeah, it's your choice, but the tech team will guide us and take, uh, take the group pictures. Yeah, somebody from the tech team is going to walk us through that or go ahead and uh, several pages, again, over 150 participants from around the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, um, Terry. Uh, may we request everyone who um, is comfortable turning on their videos, um, you can do that. And we can always choose to raise our fists. Yes. Okay. Um, so for our tech team, we can already start um, taking uh, pictures on screen. Okay, we will now um, proceed into, yes. Should we all say long live international solidarity? <laughs> yes, yes, go ahead, let's do that. All right, everyone smile, long live long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. Long live.
Long live. Long live international solidarity. Long live international solidarity. That's great, everyone. Did we get all of the photos? Um, hold on a second. Um, are we okay? I'm just checking up with my tech team. It's great to see familiar faces and new faces here as well. One more screenshot. Show your, um, how do you call that? Fighting face. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm just waiting for my tech team. Okay, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, yeah. Terry? Yeah, we'll close. Go ahead and close, everyone. So the event today has been live streamed on the Facebook page of Migrante International. Uh, Ray, if you can drop that link again into the chat, the Facebook page of Migrante, and I think ILPS will share it as well. We tried to do a Spanish recording of today's forum so they can be shared with our friends from Latin America and around the world who speak Spanish. So we'll try to share that and the comments of Professor Sison and all of the reactors. We're gonna to try to compile those. There's a video on the Palestinian struggle from Canada. We'll try to send all of that to everyone. So please stay tuned for more fora activities and actions together with the members and participants in Commission 15 of the ILPS. And we invite all of you today to join the work of Commission 15 of ILPS. As we expect the imperialist crisis to worsen, it is imperative to also heighten our unity and actions in January, the Commission uh, 15 shall call for a meeting of members to map out our plans. Do, do we um, watch out for announcements and details of that meeting in January? So thank you again to everyone. Down with imperialism and long live international solidarity. Have a good rest of your evening, day, uh, morning, and uh, thank you again for coming.